So finally, I want to come on to this whole subject of MISRA C compliance, which is probably an aspect of the guidelines which has been has received much more emphasis in the new version of MISRA C. What exactly do we mean by MISRA compliant code? It's a term which has been used perhaps rather loosely in the past and without a proper understanding and some of the concepts which have been introduced into MISRA 2004 have been introduced with a view to clarifying exactly what this means. So I'm going to deal with that under three headings, enforceability, decidability and deviations. First of all, enforceability. At the beginning of, MIS of the MISRA 2012 document, there is a declaration of the vision behind the, the new project. And one of the headings under that vision is that the purpose should be to increase the number of guidelines that can be processed by static analysis tools. And that was one of the main motivations for drawing this distinction between directives and rules. The principle that directives are something that uh, cannot be enforced in general, although tools can sometimes assist with the enforcement, the principle behind directives is that they're not necessarily automatically enforceable, whereas rules the principle behind a rule is that it can be automatically enforced. And fortunately, the vast majority of guidelines come under that heading. 143 out of 159 are rules, and therefore they are enforceable in the sense that they are a static analysis tool can, in general, detect non-compliance. Another paragraph in MISRA 2012, the ability to detect the maximum number of violations possible while minimizing the number of false positive messages is therefore an important factor in choosing a tool. I'm referring here to a bit of research that was conducted by uh, an organization in Belgium and the purpose of the research was to actually investigate the whole subject of enforcement of MISRA rules. And the research project was conducted by compiling some test code for 11 key rules in MISRA 2004. And the rules were selected by a panel of industrial partners. The test code was analysed using a number of analysis tools which claim to enforce compliancy with MISRA C. And the focus of the investigation was really to examine two attributes of the tools. The first attribute being how effective is the tool in identifying rule violations. Obviously a consideration of prime importance. But there is a second important consideration in the effectiveness of a tool and that is a, a measure of does the tool actually produce what we call false positive messages? Does it I, highlight problems which actually don't exist? And the way this information was presented was in the form of a graph where the vertical axis was a measure of the effectiveness of the tool in reporting all the violations and the horizontal axis was a measure of whether the tool produced false positives or not. And so a tool which featured in the bottom left hand corner was not doing a very good job and a tool which featured in the top right-hand corner could be said to be doing an excellent job. 
reporting all violations with no false positives. And this was this represent representation was intended to reflect the overall performance of tools. The author of the report uh, observed at the end that um, sadly not all tools proclaiming to provide MISRA C compliance um, actually measured up to that requirement. And so typically uh, tools would produce a, a graph like this. The annotations on this graph are quite small but each blue dot represents a rule and as we can see in this representative example some of these this particular tool enforced found all the violations of certain rules but not of all the rules but it also encountered quite a number of false positives our own tool QAC fortunately performed rather better and was able to identify all violations with no false positives for which we were quite pleased. Moving on back to the subject of decidability which we've already discussed briefly Section 521 of the new document, process activities required in MISRA C, and there are quite a number of these. But one of the requirements in terms of the process is that in order to comply with MISRA, a development organization to draw up a compliance matrix demonstrating how compliance with each MISRA C guideline is going to be checked. And the point about that is that compliance cannot always be enforced statically because, as we've already shown, we have things like directives and we also have rules which are undecidable. So relying blindly on tool enforcement can be misleading. Section 5.3, where a guideline cannot be completely checked by a tool, then manual review will be required. So in the graph there we see that of the 159 guidelines in MISRA C 2012, 117 are decidable rules. That means that they are enforceable and they are decidable. And in theory, that means that a perfect tool should be able to enforce those rules perfectly. In practice, that is probably not going to be true of every tool. There are also a proportion of undecidable rules, 26, and 16 directives. So we can see there that it's only approximately 75% of the total number of guidelines for which total enforcement can be guaranteed by a perfect tool. Where tools are unable to provide enforcement, other means have to be brought into play in order to ensure compliance with that rule. So manual review becomes important. The third aspect which I want to consider in terms of compliance is this subject of deviations. Deviations have always been a, a, an aspect of the MISRA C guidelines, but they're probably becoming more into focus now than they have in the past because of the scrutiny under which this whole issue of compliance is being placed. So in order to use MISRA C, it is necessary to develop and document a deviation process 
by which justifiable non-compliances can be authorized and recorded. Later, the document goes on to say, it is important that such deviations are properly recorded and authorized. So the thing about deviations is that they are acknowledged to be necessary. Miseracy makes no bones about that. It is, it is often necessary to have deviations. In fact, it is often uh, wise to introduce deviations because of a number of factors, because of um, language extensions in embedded compilers, which are a necessary, uh, a necessary aspect of, of, use, of accessing hardware. Deviations are often necessary when it becomes necessary to interface to legacy code or COX libraries. The difficulty with deviations is that the process is very open to abuse. In fact, this is a subject which is actually under scrutiny at the current time between MISRA and uh, the Japanese motor industry because of the need to regulate the process of deviation um, more closely. And at the bottom there, I refer to a very recent publication by MISRA, which is the first stage in actually tackling the process of regulating deviations. It's a brief document, MISRA CADC. It's available from the MISRA website. Uh, and it refers to some of the principles which have been considered in terms of how deviations can be sensibly applied to coding rules. One of the key requirements for deviations is to have a management system. Programming Research have a product called QA Verify. We believe this product is very effective in the whole area of deviation management because it allows, for instance, features like annotations of code to be introduced. The essence of deviations is that they need to be documented. They need to have a rationale. They need to have authorization. And the documentation of that and relating documentation to the code requires tool support. Another aspect of the whole business of managing deviations is the fact that deviations often are applied selectively in the sense that they apply to particular parts of your project and not others. So we have support for the whole concept of baselining. The idea of baselining is that uh, deviations can, for instance, be ignored in third-party code or in interfaces to legacy code where changes may not be permissible. And therefore, MISRA compliance may only be applicable to code which is under your own personal control. Another important aspect of QA Verify is the whole issue of collaborative code review, the fact that it is necessary for deviations to be authorized. It is necessary for manual code inspections to be uh, a key feature of achieving compliance. So QA Verify uh, is a very effective tool in actually managing that whole process, in actually applying diagnostic information annotations to code in a non-intrusive way and managing those in the form of applying them to deviations. So in summary, the whole essence of MISRA C compliance, the foundation of that and one of the things that MISRA C 2012 has achieved 
is bringing into much better focus the whole issue of how important it is for coding rules to be enforceable on the one hand and decidable on the other hand. The distinction between directives and rules, the distinction between decidable rules and undecidable rules. What is needed in terms of uh, responding to that coding standard, those decidable coding rules, is to have effective, accurate and automatic enforcement and analysis. And that's what we believe QAC provides. And finally, as we've just referred to, we need a deviation management process supported by tools. And that is where we believe QA Verify does a very good job.